Hello, welcome to the Monday, August 24th, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Last Friday, I wrote a quick uh, post based on a question that came via Twitter from Jack Reisetter, who's uh, famous for his Darknet Diaries podcast. Now, one thing he asked is, how do you help people that are being surveilled or that are being stalked by someone? This is an issue that we had come up at the Internet Storm Center a couple of times where people have reached out to us for help and we are always willing to help and eager to help, but in the past have found that many of these problems go beyond what is just solvable with sort of a quick technology solution or with helping someone investigate a suspicious machine. You have to be a little bit careful uh, with some of these situations, particularly if the request comes from a stranger that you haven't met before, that you know really nothing about. And in this post, I summarize some of the issues that we have come across and also at the end with the help from readers and from Twitters, a couple of links with organizations that can help with this particular problem that sadly is all too common. But what it really fundamentally comes down to, this is often more than just a technology problem. So it's good and better to ask for help from someone that can look beyond the technology issue that probably exists here. Now, we all probably have learned by now that it's not a great idea to expose the Windows RDP service to the public. So one trick that some administrators play is, and not a bad idea necessarily, if you have to expose RDP, is to move RDP away to a different port instead of the default port 3,389. Well, it turns out the attackers are maybe a little step ahead of you here. And we do have a post by Guy looking into what other ports are being scanned for RDP servers. Now, what Guy is going by here is the cookie MSTS hash a header that's included in these RDP requests. And interestingly, he even found uh, quite a good number of probes on port 20. Three. Now, personally, I'm not really sure why an administrator would move that RDP port to port 23. Maybe they figure, hey, uh, it's something that if it's being scanned by an attacker, they'll think it's actually Telnet and they'll not prove it for RDP. Wrong. They are sending RDP requests to port 23 as well. Of course, it's hard to tell if uh, there is a reasonable large populations of RDP servers listening on port 23, or if the attackers are just scanning that because, well, they got bored scanning other ports. And then we got an interesting vulnerability that was disclosed by the Talos uh, group in its Centarian modules. Now, Probably you have never heard of Centarian before if you haven't really dealt sort of with the automation industry, but these are essentially little systems on a chip that include components like, for example, GSM, USB, various sensors and the like that are then connected to IP networks as well as, of course, to industrial devices. And these modules do run a Java interpreter. So you can run Java code, they call it midlets, that will then perform certain automation functions. Very interesting vulnerability here. Essentially, they're trying to protect hidden files. Hidden files, as a sort of Unix convention, start here with a dot. Now, typically on these systems, you first have a trife letter, like a colon and then a slash and then dot and the name of the hidden file. But if you use two slashes, then of course you still end up with the same file and you are able to bypass the input validation that checks if you're actually accessing a hidden file. And this way you may read any hidden file on the system. So pretty trivial bypass. 
pretty large install base for these devices. Like for a lot of these sort of hidden IoT devices like it, they're talking about something like 3 billion network devices annually. Not really sure how many of them are vulnerable. And of course, a huge sort of supply chain around this. Talus has released updates for this vulnerability, but of course, all the different vendors and such that are inc inc including these modules into their solutions will have to apply and provide the patch to their customers. And we've got an interesting vulnerability in Google Drive that apparently has not been patched yet. The problem here is that an attacker may trick Google Drive into displaying a harmless extension, like in the example provided as a proof of concept, a .jpg file, when indeed the user actually downloads a .exe file. This looks like a sort of double extension problem and uh, has been reported to Google, but at this point, apparently not yet fixed. The problem was made public by system administrator Amy Kochi, who sort of ran into uh, this uh, problem. Given that uh, Google Cloud services like Google Drive and such are often used in phishing attacks, that of course uh, could be used then to again trick a user into downloading a malicious file. The user would still have uh, to execute it or run it. And of course on the user system, the file extension should display be displayed properly. Of course, some operating systems don't display the final extension, and then you may have, again, a problem. Well, this is it for today. So thanks for listening, and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.